Peace to the 12. Y'all see the title. The Roman Edomites. I'll say that one more time. The Roman Edomites. All right. And originally, this was going to be a short video. And I was just going to pull out the connection of what links the Idumians to the Romans. But um, I decided to go ahead and make this an in-depth video with different presentation points to really hammer home that Esau is who we say he is. And by who we say he is, I'm talking about he is the so-called white man in mass. I say in mass because you have people that look like the so-called white man, but their seed line goes back to other nations because you can't just go off of skin color completely. But once again, population in mass, they are in fact the Edomites, all right? Um, and for those of you that wonder what I mean by the seed lines, I've told you, I've done videos on this before, but you are who your father is. I ain't about to argue with you. That's in the scriptures. All right, you can go watch the video. I'll link it in the description. But anyway, so we're going to go through different presentation points to really hammer home that Esau is who we say he is, and that being the so-called white man. So first, we'll touch on what, what I meant with the Roman connection. So let's go to Lamentations chapter 4 and verse 22, right? In Lamentations 4 and 22, it reads, The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. Right? So, in the King James Version, in most versions, it reads, O daughter of Edom, in Lamentations 4 and 22. But when we go to the Aramaic Targum, and for those of you that don't know what the Aramaic Targum is, it's basically the Bible written in Aramaic, all right, it was the Bible translated in Aramaic, all right, a Targum was an originally spoken translation of the Hebrew Bible that a professional translator gives in a common language, right, Aramaic translation of the Bible, right, so when we go to Lamentations 4 and 22 from the Aramaic Targum, it don't say Edom, it says Rome, right, it says, uh, it says, uh, after this, your iniquity will be finished, O congregation of Zion, and you will be freed by the hands of the king, Messiah, and Elijah, he high priest, and the Lord will no longer exile you. And at that time, I will punish your iniquities. Wicked Rome. So it says Rome. Okay, punish your iniquity. It says daughter Edom, but here it says, I'll punish your iniquities. Wicked Rome, built in Italy and filled with crowds of Edomites. All right? <laughs> so that's your Roman connection. Right? And, and there's a lot of things I could go into. Um, but uh, for sake of time, let's just get on to proving uh, the red race. I just skipped about 10 slides, but whatever. Uh, the red race, which, because they're really not, they're really not uh, pale, they're really red. All right? Like, that's why I got this thumbnail where you got this red moon shining over them, right? They're really red. And this eagle will come into play too in this thumbnail in a minute. But that's the, the connection. You know, I skipped a couple of slides on the Esau Roman connection, but we'll hammer it all home anyway. So we'll go to the red race. Right? Now, I've, done, I've told you guys this before, but we'll touch on it again. When you go to Genesis 25 and 25, and it says. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau, right? Now, it says he came out red all over, right? Red all over like a hairy garment, they called his name Esau. In other translations, it's the first came out red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, all right? The first came out red, his whole body like a hairy cloak. So he was red, and he had hair over him, right? Now, I, I mentioned this before, and the red it's talking about is like, like crimson, like scarlet, right? Because we look at the dyed red goat skins. This, these are the red shades you get. And you can read about the red, the the the, the ram skins dyed red, uh, all throughout the scriptures, uh, particularly during the uh, four books of the Bible, like in Exodus thirty-five or Exodus thirty-nine. It talks about ram skins dyed red, ram skins dyed red, and the way they even made the way they even dyed these ram skins, they use something called the crimson worm or the scarlet worm. And it secretes a crimson red dye, which stains the tree red. So that's how they're able to dye it. Now, I mentioned all this to say that it's interesting that they say he came out red. Because when Jacob is born, Ishmael is born, uh, Elam, uh, everybody when they're born, they don't give you their complexion. They don't say this one came out 
dark brown. This one came out light brown. This one came out yellow. This one came. They don't say that. All right, because there's one group of people that looks different from everybody else. Everybody else is a different shade of brown. But I'll touch on that in a minute and expound upon it. First, I want to get a book written by, uh, let me move this real quick. Written by, uh, there we go, Alan Howard Godby. He wrote a book called The Lost Tribes of Myth. Alan Howard Godby was born in 1864. He died in 1948, and Alan Howard Godby was a Methodist minister, a Methodist historian, a teacher, writer, a teacher, a writer, a scholar in the field of the Old Testament, Hebrew history, archaeology, and Semitics, right? So, uh, anyway, let's go to his book, The Lost Tribes of Myth. We're going to go to page 85, and he's going to talk about Esau Edom's complexion, right? He says, uh, but the Old Testament also knows the red-skinned people. The red-skinned people, right? The red-skinned people, right? Anyway, but the Old Testament also knows the red-skinned people and specifically describes them as Edomites and adds the information that the Edomites were particularly fond of dressing in red skins, right? That's not really what it's talking about, but it's telling you that they're red, <laughs> Um, let me see. But Genesis 25, 25 declares the ancestor of Edom was born red all over like a garment of red goat hair. Yeah, like a garment of red goat hair, like a dyed ram skin, right? Like a dyed ram skin. Um, and he mentions it too. The tabernacle, uh, the great, who, uh, great son, grandson Caleb who demanded red skins dyed red. Right and decorations, so he's comparing them to these redskins I showed. I just want to type on that. And like I said earlier, isn't it interesting that his complexion is mentioned in Genesis twenty-five and twenty-five, but it's not so with anybody else, right? Right. Like when we go to, uh, when we go to the Table of Nations, when you're dealing with Elam, Elam's complexion isn't mentioned. Matter of fact, let me prove that because I didn't, I didn't include the slides. But I'll do it now. I'll do it now. Let me do this real quick. So it says Elam. Let's go to Elam. Bear with me one second. Elam. Come on, Google. So we pull this up. So when Elam was born, and we're going to touch on this word ready too. Now when Elam was born, in Genesis 10 and 22, it says, The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. So when they were born, their complexion was not mentioned. They didn't say he came out red. They didn't say he came out black. They didn't say he came out brown. Why is that? Because everybody else is a different shade of brown. The only red one is the so-called white man, right? Whether you're dealing with an Asian, a Polynesian, an African, uh, whatever, right? Uh, an East Indian, an Arab. There are different shades of brown, from light brown to dark brown, except for one, which is red, which is Edom. And we're going to deal with Europe as well, because people say, well, what about Europeans? I had a guy in my comments talk about that months back. I'm going to touch on that. But uh, anyway, let's continue on. So we got Elam, his complexion wasn't mentioned. Let's go to Ashur. Did I, did I include that already? Yeah, Ashur. His complexion wasn't mentioned either. Aram. Aram's complexion wasn't mentioned either. Um, let's go to Ishmael. All right, Arab. Ishmael. Let's go to Ishmael real quick. Um, Ishmael. Right? So let's go to Ishmael. Right? So when we go to Ishmael in Genesis 16 and 11, it says, An angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. All right, and they bear Ishmael. No mention of his complexion. Isn't that interesting? Right? 
There's no mention of his complexion. Because he was just another shade. He was just a brown. He was brown skin like everybody else. Right? Now we go to. I mean, I pre, I've already proven my point, but we're going to keep going. We go to Moab and Ammon. Right? Uh, their complexion isn't mentioned either. Uh, rather, it's in Genesis 19 37. Right, you go to Genesis nineteen thirty-seven. Talks about Moab. It says, "In the firstborn bear a son and called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day." His complexion isn't mentioned. Or when we go to Ammon, uh, Genesis nineteen thirty-eight. Um, his complexion isn't mentioned either. Uh, Jesus 1938 and the younger she also bare a son and called his name ben -Ami, the son the same as the father of the children of Ammon unto this day right so all them different instances and I could go on and on and on remember we're going Ammon Cush I'm gonna get Japheth too because people like to say Japheth is the so-called white man Japheth's complexion isn't mentioned either all right <laughs> right now, isn't that interesting? The sons of Japheth, whether it's Gomer, whoever, right? Javan, their complexion isn't mentioned, right? Because you go to Genesis 5 and 32, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all right? And I could go on and on and on, all right? Nobody's complexion is mentioned except Edom, all right? Because he's the red one, the only red one. Everyone else is a different shade of brown. From dark to light brown. Right? So what about Ruddy? Because some people will say, well, what about Ruddy, man? You knew it, uh, Ruddy. <laughs> you know, and they always like to quote Psalms of Solomon 5 and 10. And they say, my beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. Well, first of all, that's not talking about his skin color. Even when you go to here, the word white right here, it means clear, bright, dazzling, glowing. That's right, and this just says, my beloved is white and ruddy, but you go to other translations, it'll say something like, in New Living Translation, it'll say, my love is dark and dazzling, better than 10,000 others, right? Radiant and ruddy, dark and dazzling, radiant and ruddy, dazzling and ruddy, King James, white and ruddy, white and ruddy, dazzling and reddish. So, no, it's not talking about that. Now, we'll touch on this word ruddy as well, because if you look at ruddy now, you look at a ruddy skin, it'll show you so-called white people. In particular, it'll show you gingers. <laughs> And they even got the red complexion right there. But uh, they'll tell you that this is ruddy skin. This is a damn lie. Because you type in a ruddy cow, you got reddish brown. A ruddy horse, reddish brown. Ruddy goat, reddish brown, right? Matter of fact, in the same book I mentioned earlier, The Lost Tribes of Myth, um, Alan Godby, uh, Godby, who a P, what's a PhD scholar, he says uh, he calls the uh, Fulani or the Fulas tribe he calls them ruddy, clear brown people. You know, like this type of ruddy, clear brown, you know? But let's read it. He says, uh, Foot is the son of Ham, that is, a vassal of Egypt. Now the Fulas, who have pushed across Africa from Somaliland to Senegambia and the lower Niger, have the very tradition that they are the descendants of Foot, the son of Ham, right? Now when we go down to here, he says, They call themselves also Pool. Fool or fool be or pool be clear or ruddy, clear brown people. So he says, ruddy, clear brown people. Notice he used the exact word ruddy, right? Funny he would say that because in certain translations, he even uses words like clear and ruddy. Well, let's see what these Fulani people look like, the Fulas. Let's see what they look like. These are the ruddy, clear brown people of the Fulani tribe. All right, as you can clearly see, they're reddish brown, clear brown complexion, right? So uh, we're getting in there. Let's go back to my little presentation points. So we got the Esau Roman connection. We got the red race. We got the word ready. Now let's go. Can so-called black people create so-called white children? Now, when I get to this architecture part, it's really going to hammer it home. But can so-called black people create so-called white children? Because I had a guy in my comments recently. He was like, oh, we, we don't come from the same womb. We can't produce those people. You know, which is which is an uneducated thing to say, because uh, 
to this very day, you have so-called black people with both black parents who give birth to so-called white children, right? I'll give you three, just three instances right here. It says three African couples gave birth to a white child, right? All right. Three African couples gave birth to a white child, white child, while also having brown skinned kids, right? Now, I'm just going to touch on, focus on this one in particular, right? This is Ben and Angela Ahegboro, the black Nigerian couple. It says, Ben and Angela are a Nigerian couple living in London. They are parents of two black children, and their third delivery was a white child. Straight blonde hair. Look at that. He came out, he came out red, right? But uh, it was a white child. Their mother gave birth to a little girl with blonde hair, white skin, and blue eyes named Nachi Ahegboro. How is this possible? See that? It says, for scientists, this genetic phenomenon is possible. I know it's possible. <laughs> because the original man is the dark-skinned man. But remains unexplained to this day. The astonishment is great because these parents have already had two dark-skinned children and have no white ancestors in their families, nor is it the result of adultery. So they don't have any white ancestors, yet they produced a white child. And this also debunks that damn lie they tell you that Oh, yeah, Europe was originally dark-skinned, but uh, they evolved in the white skin. No, they don't, because these people produced one. Debunk that. All right, let's get other examples of black people having so-called white babies. This African woman right here, look at that, blonde hair. This is a black mother in Brazil. She's got dark-skinned children, and she produced uh, three so-called albino children, and the father was black also. Look, straight blonde hair, right? This is a Mercy Tribes woman nursing her albino child in Ethiopia, in Omo Valley. All right? <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, man. So, that's that. Kind of speeding through it because I got like 150 slides. Um, so, we got the Roman Connection, the Red Race. and the Roman, We're going to go back to the Roman Connection when we get on to the architecture and the symbol of the eagle as well as end time prophecy. All right, but anyway. All right, so we got the can so-called black people create so-called white children? Yes, they can. Next question that's often asked is the question asked, what about Europe or Europeans? Because people assume, for whatever reason, people assume that these people have always been in Europe, and they haven't. All right, that's why people like to call them Japheth, and they're not Japheth. So let's go into that, right? So what about Europe? Yeah, what about the the country, excuse me, the continent of Europe? Well, I've already done a bunch of videos on it, a bunch of videos on it that you guys can go watch for more detail, but I'll touch on it again. Uh, basically, the originals look different than Mr. Johnny Come Lately. This man wasn't always in Europe. Can you prove that? Yes, I can. I can prove that. First of all, when you Google it, it'll tell you straight up on Google from Scientific Research Publishing. It says the first people of Europe were black. It says the archaeological, anthropological, and genetic evidence indicated that the first Europeans were dark-skinned sub-Saharan Africans who carried mtna DNA haplogroup N and Y chromosome C6 into Europe. So when we look at archaeological evidence, anthropological evidence, and genetic evidence, it all proves that so-called black people were the first people in Europe, right? And I don't even like to use the term so-called black, but they were a dark-skinned people that lived in um, Europe prior to the to the so-called white man, right? And you look up Cheddar Man. All right, Cheddar Man. They say he's ten thousand years ago, the oldest, uh, the oldest almost complete skeleton of our species, Homo sapiens, found in Britain. Right, Cheddar Man, dark-skinned. Right, he looks like an Australian Aboriginal. Uh, that's because Japheth are the Australian Aborigines. I've done videos on that already. Uh, go watch my son, uh, watch my video, uh, what was it? Europe, Original Sons of Japheth or something like that. Uh, did I include it here? No, I didn't. But anyway, uh, let's continue on. This is from Independent. Cheddar Man Discovery, first modern Breton had dark skin. As a reminder, we are all from Africa. Expert says, I wouldn't say we're all from Africa, but... All these nations, they come from the so-called black man, all right? <laughs> you know, I've said this before, um, and I've proven it through DNA evidence, but DailyMail.com. 
GCSE pupils to be taught that the nation's earliest inhabitants were Africans who were in Britain before the English. That's in Daily Mail. The Guardian, first modern Britons had dark to black skin. Uh, Giz Gizmodo, turns out the first British people were actually black. So they've done studies on this. And you can do more than just a Google. You can go to books that are written by anthropologists. This is a guy by the name of Giuseppe Sergi. He was an Italian anthropologist. All right. And funny enough, he was born in Italy. Let's see what this Ital uh, Italian anthropologist has to say. In his book, The Mediterranean Race, A Study of the Origin of European Peoples. Right? So we go to page 252. It reads, It is the cranial and facial forms that leads us to accept the consignuity of the African Hamites of red, brown, and black color. So even he mentions the red, brown. That would be ruddy. With the Mediterranean peoples, the same characters reveal the co continuity of the primitive inhabitants of Europe, right? And of the remains in various regions and among various peoples with the populations of Mediterranean and hence also with the Hamites of Africa. So the primitive inhabitants of Europe look similar to the African, the African Hamites, according to this guy, which, I mean, didn't it say uh, the first Euro Europeans were dark-skinned sub-Saharan Africans? Right, isn't that what it said? Now it says, For some time past, I have reached the conclusion that so-called Ryan Gerber type of the Germans and the Viking type of the Scandinavians being identical in character with the Mediterranean and the Hamitic types had the same African origin. So he's saying the Germans, the Scandinavians, the Viking types, the uh, they, they link with African origin. Right? The populations with these cranial and facial forms in the North Europe are, as I have shown, of African origin. Separate branches of the same trunk. Alright? That's what he said. And he was an Italian anthropologist. Born in the 1800s. And the word primitive simply means first, earliest, prehistoric, ancient. Right? Um, give me one second. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, so let's go to the next person. David Ritchie, another guy born in the 1800s. He was a anthropologist as well. Let's see what he had to say. And all anthropology means is uh, the study and origin and development of human societies and cultures. He wrote a book called Ancient and Modern Britons. There's a volume one and a volume two. We're going to focus on volume one for this. He's going to say similar things. You go to page 7. He says, Not only does Mr. Huxley argue from the appearance of certain existing Britons that they represent in a degree a British race of Australoid type, um, but there are visible and tangible proofs on the previous existence in our island of such a people. These proofs are craniological. I mean, they're skulls. We know, says the writer of a small pamphlet on this subject, that the first inhabitants of Britain and more especially those of the northern parts, were craniologically of a type approaching to the Negro or to the Australian race. And we do know that because he said what? Um, the northern parts of Britain. We know that uh, from videos I've done in the past. Um, it talks about the skulls found in chambered mounds in Great Britain, in which Dr. Daniel refers to as being the earliest race, was of the Australoid type. Right? Uh, in his remarks upon the Aborigines of Tasmania, Mr. Bonwick refers more than once to their kinship structurally with certain prehistoric Europeans, right? So that's why I told you the original Japhites are the, uh, or not, the, the real Japhites are the people that look akin to the Aboriginal Australians and the people like the Polynesian type, things like that, right? Um... The earliest inhabitants of North Britain were cumbosymphalic boat-headed approaching to a Negroid or Austra Australian rather than to a Mongol or Arctic type, right? Let's get one more on this book, verse 16, not verse 16, page 16. Um, how far are we along? 24 minutes in back. 
The question of the origin of the white races this is page 16, ancient modern Britons. The question of the origin of the white races, which have now held long held supremacy in these islands, scarcely enters into the present inquiry, which has to do more with their colored predecessors, meaning pre predecessors mean before them, right? While while afford as we see hints that the home, if not the cradle of the white race, was Europe. But there seems little probability of any of these theories ever becoming substantiated, meaning they're not from Europe and you can't prove that they're originally from Europe. We have seen, we have just seen that many scientific men hold that there are some grounds for believing that portions at least of Europe have formerly been inhabited by black, tawny, and copper colored races, right? And we're going to keep going into that, right? And for those of you that might think this is far-fetched, uh, I'll do some in a minute. At the end of this uh, part of this presentation. All right. Actually, I'll just say it now. For those of you that say, oh, that's far-fetched that they don't come from Europe. Well, let's look at their track record, right? In America, whether it's North America or South America, the so-called white man is there. Is he from there? No. All right. In particular, in places like Massachusetts in North America. Massachusetts, that's a Native American name. Yet there's not very many Native Americans in Massachusetts. The majority of people in Massachusetts are so-called white people. Yet... They're not from there, right? The same in South America. When you go to places like Australia, Australia was ran by the Aboriginal, by the Aboriginal Australian, the so-called Australian Aborigine, and yet now white people are the majority in Australia. Same can be said about New Zealand, and let's not forget that now they occupy the land of Israel, right? And other places, you know, uh, parts of Central Asia. There's parts of Central Asia, like if you look at Kazakhstan. All this. As a matter of fact, even Russia, for those of you who know, the majority of Russia is in the continent of Asia. All right. But anyway, y'all can look all that up. But uh, Alexander Winchill, he was a geoscientist. Let's see what he had to say. In his book, Our Remote Ancestor, we're going to go to page 247. Um, they came from Atlantis in northern Africa. Uh, at the time when the Hamite Berbers were gaining possession, they overran the Spanish Peninsula, founded city, cities, built a navy, carried on commerce, extended their empire over the countries that later were known as Gaul and Britain, held Italy and Sicanus when Rome was founded. Right? So he's saying that uh, he believes that Hamites were originally all over Europe, from Spain, the Spanish Peninsula, to Italy, to Britain, to Gaul, France. Right? Uh then he says the pal the pal the Palasgic Empire. I don't know how you say it. Pelagic Empire was at the Mediterranean was at the Meridian as early as twenty five hundred BC. All right, the people came from the islands of the Aegean and more remotely from Asia Minor. They were originally a branch of the sun burnt Hamitic stock. So he's letting you know they were originally so called black people that were in Gaul, Britain. Sicanus, which Rome was founded, Italy, uh, the Pe the Pelasic Empire, and let's see what that is. The Pelasgians were the pre-Hellenic peoples who inhabited Greece, islands, and coasts of the Aegean Sea before the arrival of the Bronze Age Greeks. So, in other words, these were the people that were there before the Hellenistic Greeks. In other words, the so-called White Greeks, right? As a matter of fact, he said 2500 BC. That's 500 years before what he's about to say. Because in this part of our remote ancestry, page 246, it says Indo-Europeans are known to have been in Europe as early as 2000 BC. So these Hamites that he calls Hamites, uh, once again, I think that they're Japhites. They beat the Europeans to these European settlements for five, uh, at least 500 years back. He said 2500 BC. And then he says the Indo-Europeans got there in 2000 BC. This is a 500 year difference, right? Uh, when what is Indo-European? He said Indo-European. Indo-European. What is an Indo-European? That's just another word of saying a so-called white man. An Indo-European in Blue and Box 18th century term for the white race of mankind, which he derived from the people who lived in Caucasus. The term is usually synonymous with Caucasus, European, or white. So an Indo-European is talking about the so-called white man. Um, it's the same when they use words like Aryan. Um, it's just talking about the so-called white man. Also the Indo-European, right? Now, in later parts of history, they tried to make Aryan, Aryan mean the blonde hair, blue eye, but originally it was not so. Uh, but anyway, that's more stuff anyway. Let's go to Prehistoric Man and His History. 
uh, by Scott Elliott George Francis, where he states, um, the Negroid of Grimaldi. You can actually Google the Negroid of Grimaldi. Um, we'll just go here. The, the, we're going to highlight the portions. These... Eric nations and their Magdalene descendants pervaded all Central and Southern Europe, right? And they were of Negroid. These were a Negroid, perhaps pygmy folk, right? From where? Italy, France, uh, Phoenicia, like the Phoenicians. Um, the Eric nation was originally an African. He traversed North Africa on his way from Egypt and Mesopotamia. The other pygmies are the oldest African race known to us. These Negroids, discovered by Dr. Varnell, show that the Aragnations were acquainted with a Negroid stock, right? And that includes Spain, Sardinia, Ostorf, Caithness, Sierra, all throughout, right? Negroid means akin to the Negroes. All right, now, even when you Google a tri uh, the people known as the Minoans, the Minoans were a member of a non-Indo-European people. We know Indo-European once again. What does that mean? Indo-European means white race of mankind. So there's a there's a group known as the Minoans. They were a non-Indo-European. They were non-white. All right, they flourished in 3000 to uh, 1100 BC on the islands of Crete during the Bronze Age. Now these are the Minoans. As you can see, clear as day, the Minoans are brown-skinned people. All right, akin to an Australian Aboriginal or maybe like a Polynesian, right? Uh, Minoan civilizations. These are the Minoan paintings that they have. They're all brown skinned, right? This is a reconstruction of a fresco of procession from a palace in Nosos, detailed young man carrying an offer offerings to goddess. All right, these are brown skinned people, all right? They even have a... Uh, they even have a Minoan picture that's called Africans in Bronze Age Crete. They, this painting is literally called the Captain of the Blacks. Minoan mercenaries. Captain of the Blacks. Minoan mercenaries. You can't make this stuff up. This is from 1440 to 1400 BC. And this, this painting is literally called the Captain of the Blacks. <laughs> right? Uh... You know, I could, I could keep going on, but I think I made my point. Now, you know what? I'm going to hammer it on some more. Just why not? You know. Let's go to Godfrey Higgins. He was an historian, antiquarian. Uh, let's see what he had to say in his book, Anocalypsis, Volume 1. We're going to go to page 216. He says, Mr. Franklin makes an observation, which is new to me, that the ancient Aturians had the countenances of Negroes, the same as the images of Buddha in India. So he says the Aturians had the countenance of Negroes. Well, who are the Aturians? The Etruscan member of an ancient people of Aturia, Italy. All right, the Aturians are also known as the Etruscans. Some call them the Etruscans, the Etruscan people. The Etruscan civilization, all right? And it says much of their culture and even history was either obliterated or assimilated into an, its conqueror, Rome. Yeah, they did it with America. All right, we learn about American history, but we don't learn much about the Native Americans, right? I imagine if you're in Australia, you don't learn very much about the Australian Aboriginals either, <laughs> right? They just obliterated their culture, their history, right? And they teach you about the so-called white man. Um, and we can go to early man in Britain and his place in the tertiary period by William Boyd Dawkins. He talks about the Etruscans. We're going to go to page 323. Where he states that uh, from the intimate manner in which they are associated with the Iberians by classical writers coupled with the agreement and small stature and swarthy complexion, they belong to the same non-Aryan branch of the human race. When he says non-Aryan, remember he's talking about non-white. Um, small swarthy Etruscans. Alright, now I'm going to go down to here for sake of time. Just pointing out if we could go deep enough in past time, we should find that the whole of Europe was inhabited solely by a swarthy non-Aryan population. So all of Europe was originally inhabited by non-Aryan, non-so-called white people, right? You go to Riddles of Prehistoric Times by James H. Anderson, H. Anderson and it reads, or let me get something about this book real quick. It says, this book 
has been considered by academics and scholars great significance and values to literature. So they have high regard for this book, Riddles of Prehistoric Times by James H. Anderson. This is what he had to say in his book, page 58. He says, The first inhabitants of Southern Europe, Northern Africa, Arabia, France, and the British Islands were a race of small men who did not average in the height more than four to five feet inches. They were of a slight build with dark with a dark complexion. The they were an African people, right? Talks about the first people of Ireland were dark, calls them savage, things of that nature, right? Now we're gonna, even when you go to the PNAS, which is the uh, was it the public? Uh, I can't remember what PNAS stands for. Let me read it. Look it up real quick. P-N-A-S. The Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. That's what it is. Let me get that. Um, one second. So, we go to the PNAS study which is the uh proceedings of the national academy of sciences of the united states of america very credible they tell you the same thing in their in their findings their studies it says uh i'm just going to read the highlighted portion for sake of time and the title it says the questionable contribution of neolithic and bronze age to european cranial form it says the surprise is that the Neolithic peoples of Europe and their Bronze Age successors are not closely related to the modern inhabitants. In other words, in other words, during the Bronze Age and prior, they do not resemble the modern so-called white people. That's what that means. And we know they don't because these are the Minoans. Um, and they don't look like so-called white people. Um, then he says... Talks about clear link to sub-Saharan Africa. Sam neither sample ties in which the Cro-Magnum once is once suggested. So basically, the modern inhabitants are not even closely related to the peoples in the uh, the peoples in ancient Europe. All right. So that's that. That was a long one, but we're going to continue on. Where are we at? Um, one second. So we proved we got the East Side Roman connection, the red race, the word ready. Can so called black people have white children? The question about the Europeans. All right, now the next question would be then how did the Edomites get into Europe? Well, a lot of things happened, but I'll speak about Alexander the Great, also known, or I call Alexander the Creep or the Freak, Alexander of Macedon. So let's go to that. If Europe was originally dark-skinned people, how did so-called white people get into Greece and into Rome? Well, first we have to understand that the Macedonians are Amalekites, which go back to Esau, all right, which would be a tribe of the Edomites. Now we go to Genesis 36 and 10. It reads, These are the names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Adol, the wife of Esau, Reuel, the son of Bashamoth, the wife of Esau. So Esau had a son, his name was Eliphaz. You go to Genesis 36 and 12. It says that Timna was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she buried to Eliphaz, Emelech. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife, right? Um, so we know that Emelech is the son of Eliphaz, which was the son of Esau. So, so Emelech is the grandson of Esau. You go to 1 Samuel 15, 32. It says, Then says Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately, and Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. So Agag was a king of the Amalekites. So Agag goes back to Amalek. That's important because when you go to Esther 3 and 10, it says, And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, or Haman, the son of Amadatha, the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. So the Agagites go back to Agag, which goes back to Amalek, which goes back to Eliphaz, which goes back to Esau. Now we go to editions of Esther 16 and 10 found in the Apocrypha, originally a part of the King James Bible. In the distance of Esther 16 and 10, it says, For Amon, or Haman, a Macedonian, the son of Amadatha, being indeed a stranger for the Persian blood and far distant from our goodness, and as a stranger received of us. So Amon was a Macedonian. So the Macedonians are Agagites, 
which are Amalekites, which go back to Eliphaz, which go back to Esau. You know who else was a Macedonian? Ding, Alexander the Freak. All right, First Maccabees chapter 1 and 1. And it happened after that, Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came out of the land of Chetham, had smitten Darius, king of the Persians and Medes, that he reigned in his stead, the first over Greece. So the Macedonians took over Greece. They conquered the Minoan, the Etrurian type civilizations. All right? Through who? Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, which was an Agagite, which was an Amalekite, which go back to Esau. And we all know Alexander the Great is a so-called white man. All right? Nobody said... Where are the people out there say Alexander the Great is an Arab? For those people that think Esau is the Arab, which is madness. And end times prophecy really brings it home who they are anyway. But, yeah, Alexander the Great. Right? He had an alkaline nose, also known as a Roman nose. Right? I had a brother, he typed in, like, it's like a bird beak. Yeah, they call him, uh, I think they call him precarian features or something like that. Something like that. Uh, and even the dynasty that... Uh, Alexander the Great was part of was known as the Timon, the Timon, the Timon dynasty or the Argiad dynasty or the Timonus dynasty, which really, and it says uh, their legendary ancestor was Timonus. Really, that's that's going back to Timon. All right, you read about one of Esau's sons was Timon, and the sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Canaz. All right, Timon, all right, one of the sons of Eliphaz, which goes back to Esau. Son of Esau, Duke Taman. Right? So that's how they got into Europe. Short version. Next question. Often asked. Oh, not even a question. We're going to look at Edom, Greek, Roman, and American architecture. All right. For those of you that are still watching, I'll probably do a uh, split of this video and just focus on the architecture and the eagle for another video. Or, But um, let's take a look at... Edom, Greek, Roman, and American architecture, and they all link the same because they're all the same damn people. So let's go to that. Let's go to the architecture. The art of practice or design of building structures and especially habitable ones. So when we look at Petra, the historical place of Jordan, and Petra was a city in Edom. All right, when we look at Petra, look at look at this architecture. Alright, this is a site of ancient Edom. This is Petra. The land of Edom and Petra. Now look at this architecture. This architecture is the same architecture that's used in Greece, Rome, Spain, France, Germany, Russia, Great Britain, and the United States. Mount Seir, Rome, Great Britain, White House, uh, D.C., all that. Nothing new under the sun. They kept that architecture all the way from the beginning. Right? Thus dwelt Esau and Mount Seir, Esau is Edom. This is Mount Seir, Edom, in the city of Petra. This is New York, USA. Same thing, right? Uh, they have seven hills, all this, right? Let's go to this. Uh, is Washington, D.C. based on Rome? You can just ask that at Google. It says, uh, Washington's founders looked at Rome as a model. Of course they did. All right, they're all Edomites. And you mean to tell me the Romans had the same infrastructure as the Edomites? Yeah, because they're the same people. All right. And as a matter of fact, did you know that Washington was originally named Rome, Maryland? Because remember, Washington, D.C. is, I believe, it's what? Virginia and, and Virginia and Maryland combined. And originally, Washington was originally named Rome, Maryland. All right. The unique history and influence of Washington, D.C. Rome, Maryland. Washington, D.C. is Rome. Rome, Maryland was the original name of the community within Prince George's County, Maryland. Isn't that interesting that it was called Rome? Uh, and there's seven hills of Rome, right? The seven hills of Rome are Palatine Hill, Aventine Hill, Capitoline Hill, Saline Hill, Esqualine Hill, Vimanil Hill, and Quirrell Hill. Each of these hills was a separate settlement that eventually came together to form the early Roman kingdom. Right? The seven hills of Rome. Well, don't you know that there are seven hills of Washington, D.C.? Washington, D.C. was built on Capitol Hill, Meridian Hill, Floral Hills, Forest Hills, Hillbrook, Hillcrest, and Knox Hill. Same seven hills, seven hills of Rome. Right? Real simple stuff. All right, now let's look at the eagle. Let's go to the next part. 
of this presentation. So we got the architecture easy. Let's look at the Edomite symbol of the eagle. All right, let's go to that. All right, Edom is compared to the eagle all throughout the scriptures. All right, we go to Obadiah chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The vision of Obadiah thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, yet how an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye and let us rise up against her in battle. All right, this is concerning Edom. Now we go to verse 4. It says, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou nest, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, this will I bring thee down, saith the Lord Yahweh. So they exalt thyself as the eagle, and they do do that. And by exalt, that means they have a high rank and they elevate themselves. That's what they exalt, right? And for those of you that don't know, you can go to a museum. This is the relief of an eagle and thunderbolt from Petra. Now remember, Petra was a city in Edom. We went over that. This is a. Uh, this is Petra. And they had a symbol, and the symbol was the eagle. All right? Thunderbolt for Metropolitan Museum Act, March 2019. This is a relief of an eagle. All right? Timinus Gate. All right? And they associated with the Hellenistic, uh, with the Hellenist, which were the Hellenistic Greeks, which were the people after Alexander of Macedon. But anyway... And let's pull that up. Let's pull up the connection between the Greek. The Greeks have an eagle very similar. Or at least the Hellenistic Greeks. Alright. Symbol. Uh, then we go to... This is their god Zeus. Represented by the eagle. Alright, then you go... I said their fake god Zeus. Then you go to the Roman eagle. The Romans have the same eagle. And they're even all looking in the same direction too when you look at them. Uh, the, in ancient Rome, the eagle was known as the king of birds, symbol of imperial power, and therefore represented courage, strength, immortality, right? So, <laughs> they all use the eagle, which all goes back to Esau. There's even a book called Dictionary of Judaism in the Biblical Period. It says Edom. Um, Edom is compared to a pig and to an eagle, as is Rome, and Edom, Seir, and Esau are all symbols for Rome. Yeah, I mean, I agreed. <laughs> they got the Roman eagle, the sp uh, the spore. All right, then you look at the coins. You got the Greek coins. It's a Greek man with the eagle on the back. You got the Roman coin, a Roman man with the eagle on the back. You got the American coin with a uh, so-called Caucasian American man and a Roman eagle in the back. See that? I mean, it, it don't get much plainer. That exalt thyself as the eagle, and I set thy nest among the stars. The bald eagle, we got stars on the American flag. All right. Strength and freedom of America, the eagle, right? And the eagle is all, they always use the eagle, whether it's Greece, the Germans, Rome, Russia, all that. Isn't that interesting? And you read about it in Deuteronomy 28 and 49, when it tells you, Lord, Yahweh shall bring a nation against thee from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. All right, that nation that, that came as quick as the eagle fly, that's talking about the Edomites. All right, once again, they're exalted as the eagle. All right, when you go to, ver, when you go to verse 52, it says, He shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thou high and fence walls come down, whether thou trustest throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all the land, which the Lord Yahweh thy God hath given thee. All right, and what did they do? What Who besieged our gates? The Romans, the siege of Jerusalem, Right? 70 AD. Um, it talks even talks about it in uh, Obadiah 1 and 9. Yeah, let's start about it. Well, I'll talk, start at uh, 11. It's talking about the gates and the Edomites. Obadiah 1 and 11. And the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. Yeah, in the gates. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Right? And that's exactly what they did. Right? Matter of fact, I'll, I'll prove that they celebrated our downfall. Let's go to, what was that festival called? Judah Kaput. Um, I'm 
trying to find it. Yeah, Judea Capta. That's it. Judea Capta. Now, you guys can look up this on your own. Or more into this on your own. But I'll get it here. Um, they did celebrate us. Beat our downfall. Judah capped the coinage. Um, let's put it up here real for y'all. Judah capped And all it is. Is they created a series of coins. Celebrating our downfall. Judah Capta, the Romans produced a huge issue, a commemorative coin, meaning a celebratory coin, known as Judah Capta, which was the day Judea was captured. The Judah Capta coins were a series of commemorative coins originally issued by the Roman Emperor Vespasian to celebrate the capture of Judea and the destruction of the second Jewish temple by his son Titus in 70 CE during the first Jewish revolt. Right? So he besieged that gates. Go back to I Obadiah. It says, uh, Neither shouldest thou, Obadiah 1 and 12, again, it says, Neither shouldest thou have looked on the day of thy brother and the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced, that's them rejoicing, over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Right? So, let's finish this off with end time prophecy. Uh, once again, linking it back to the so-called white man being Esau, Edom. Let's go to Edom and end time prophecy. All right, let's go to that. So let's pull up the end time prophecies. So when we go to Lamentations 4, which is where I started this video off, we go a verse up, which is Lamentations 4.21. It basically lets you know that the Edomites will be the last captivity the children of Israel will be under and they will never go into captivity again. Let's read that. Lamentations 4.21. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. Right? So we'll never go into captivity again once the Lord visits Edom and gets us out of this captivity. Thus being the last captivity we'll be in will be under the Edomites. All right, and we'll never again go into captivity. Um, you can read about Daniel 2 and 36, the dream. Uh, Daniel 2 and 36, uh, 36 through 45. Um, matter of fact, I'll get it. I'll get it. Will I get it? Yeah, I'll get it. This is Daniel 2 and 36 through 45. It reads, this is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. All right. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art the head of gold. Now, backstory. Uh, Daniel saw a vision in Daniel 2 of a of a statue with a gold head, a silver body, bronze uh lower section, iron legs, and iron and clay feet. Alright? That's the backstory. And Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom represents the gold head, the Babylonian Empire, six hundred and eight BC. Um anyway. And after thee shall arise another kingdom kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth, right? And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh the pieces and subdueth all things, and iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. All right, so... You know, y'all can. I'll do a breakdown of this chapter another time. But uh, basically, you got the Babylonian Empire, the Medo Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, which was bronze. That the, the, the Medo Persian Empire was the silver, and the Iron Empire was the Roman Empire. You have iron and clay. Why is it iron and clay? Now you notice all these other empires, the 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 the, the element of the metal changed, except for this last one. Why is that? 
because the iron and clay is still the residue of the Roman Empire mixed with miry clay. All right. It, meaning the iron is still of the same nation. So if it's the Roman Empire, that means this iron and clay is still remnants of the Romans mixed with miry clay. All right, which is the so-called white man. Right. Then we go to Psalms 137 and 8. We go to Revelations and it's always talking about Babylon. Babylon the Great, the great city Babylon. Right. That Babylon is talking about is America. All right. Ran by the so-called white man. You go to Psalms 137 verse 7. It says, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it into the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewarded thee as thou hast served us. So the children of Edom are likened unto the daughters of Babylon. So anytime you read about the daughters of Babylon, rather Psalms 137, Isaiah 47, uh, Jeremiah 50, Jeremiah 51, Zechariah 2 and 7. Uh, the daughter of Babylon is talking about the Edomites. We know that because of Psalms 137. All right. Even when you type it in on Google, who is the daughter of Babylon? It'll say America. The daughter of Babylon deals with the prophetic future of the United States of America. The Bible reveals that there will be a second nation of Babylon, which is described in detail throughout Scripture and can be identified as America. All right. Even Google know that. So anytime you talk, read about Babylon, the great city of Babylon, that's talking about America. That you read about in Revelations 14, Revelation 16, 17, 18. It's talking about America because they're the daughters of Babylon, the Edomites. Right? Uh, even when you go to Revelation 17 and 1, and it says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. The great whore that sitteth upon many waters. The great whore is Babylon the great. And she sits on many waters. What does it mean she sits on many waters? Meaning she's in all these different countries. The waters are likened on the countries, right? That's why even now, when you're in the military, they'll say, I was stationed overseas. Right? Or someone say, I went across the pond or, you know, whatever they say. Right? Uh, and the United States has the most military bases. Look, that sitteth upon many waters. Well, the United States has more than 750 military bases across 80 countries and has deployed nearly 175,000 soldiers in 159 countries of the world. All right? They have more military bases. They're in more places than any other country. They're that whore that sits on many waters. All right, let's prove that the nations are likened onto waters. You go to Isaiah 17 and 12. It says, Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. So the nations are likened onto mighty waters. Like I said, overseas mean what? In a foreign country, especially one across the sea. Right? And then I'll go to 2 Ezra 6 and 7. It says Esau is the end of the world and Jacob's the beginning of the fall. It's meaning the last ruling empire would be the Edomites. That means the toes of miry clay, those are the Edomites. Second Ezra 6 and 7. And then answered I and said, What shall be the parting asunder of times? Or when shall the end of the first and the beginning of it that followeth? And he said unto me, From Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hand held first the hill of Esau. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. The hand of man is betwixt the hill and the hand. Other questions, Ezra's ask thou not. So Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. So he's the last ruling empire. All right. So, you know, long video, but I want to tackle all these points. Hopefully that hammered home who Esau is, man. You know, Lord willing, this lesson was edifying. And with that, I end this by saying peace to the 12. And I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to the Heavenly Father, the Most High, whose name is Yahweh. In the name of his only begotten son, whose name is Yahweh Shai, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ. And I want to say Shalom, which means peace, to you people that are listening and learning, to you brothers out there that's doing this work, truth, and sincerity, and to you elders that's out there that's been doing this thing before me. I say Shalom to all of y'all. Uh, peace to the 12. Once again, hopefully this was an edifying lesson. Sorry for my lack of uploads. Um, I have not been well. I'll just leave it at that. So with that, I say Shalom.